So you discuss the difficulties as a healthcare provider, uh, hot environment, uh, protective clothing that is heavy and uh, leaves you dehydrated, and so you can only work one to one and a half hours at a stretch. Um, how difficult does that make the interpersonal contact with patients and just the technical ability to do things like uh, put in a intravenous uh, syringe? Right. Um, it's very challenging, obviously. Um, I mean, we, the clinicians and I think most of the staff that worked in the ETUs would do their best to try to engage with patients in in a way that is meaningful. So basic things like writing your name on, you know, the, above your goggles so patients could identify you. Uh, I mean, this became a big part of it. Just people were so afraid being infected, being stuck in an ETU, watching their loved ones die around them. Uh, terrifying. Um, so this became a big very real practice for the clinicians this was to try to provide some human uh, familiarity contact with the patients um, I mean in terms of doing procedures it's incredibly challenging and double gloves you're, you're dripping sweat from every pore people are hypovolemic. I mean, this is incredibly challenging, um, but you do your best. You try to find a big vein. You, you don't attempt until you feel comfortable. I mean, it's incredibly challenging. So, so some have pointed to the fact that the survival rates were so much higher in uh, people who've contracted Ebola or were flown uh, to Europe or the UK or the US, you know, the numbers are a couple of handfuls, but uh, it's been said that if uh, those facilities were available, the mortality rate, case fatality rate could have been so much lower. Um, is it really realistic to imagine that that could have been provided at short notice uh, and the uh, ability to lower the case fatality rate could have been put in place with uh, more modern or more sophisticated ETUs supported from abroad. Yeah, I, again, it's a, there's several parts to this question. I mean, I think what we know about, uh, what we have learned from this outbreak is that factors that really contribute to mortality include viral load at time of presentation and age. Um, I think, so that's that's one part of it. And then accounting for other things like comorbidities in, so in the patients that uh, were infected and then expatriated, were, were taken back to the US, to the UK, um, it's, I think, what is important to remember is that they received a variety of interventions. Everything from mechanical ventilation to hemodialysis to a cocktail of various experimental therapies. Um, it is hard to know exactly which of those interventions combined with age, comorbidities, viral load impacted their outcomes. Um, the second part of it is in the midst of an outbreak, to be able to implement very sophisticated medical devices is, is very, very challenging. I mean, in the peak of the outbreak, there was just a need to do very basic things like provide enough ETU beds. Mm. Um, I think, Yes, optimistically, we would say, you know, forewarned is forearmed. And I think having things in place like point of care tests, really simple, basic uh, 
tools that can be used in a more widespread way in ETUs would perhaps um, would perhaps help perhaps help change outcomes um, in the in future outbreaks if there are future outbreaks. Things like more invasive means to deliver uh, intravenous or intraosseous resuscitation, the use of inotropes, mechanical ventilation. I mean, some of these things I think perhaps can be implemented. Some of these things are, I think, not realistic in the peak of an outbreak. Mm -hmm. Again, weighing up uh, safety as the safety and feasibility in an ETU setting, I think is needs to be considered before we talk in more detail about more sophisticated mechanical tools. To say nothing about electricity and air conditioning right. and the other factors that you'd need. The uh, ETU, you have patients, you've now uh, got a four hour turnaround on the test. How does one handle triage uh, of who arrives, who should be brought to the unit, who should be admitted, and how you deal with people with non-Ebola uh, conditions but who are in urgent acute need of medical care? So there is a triage system at emergency and the decision to admit someone to the suspect tent is really based on an assessment of risk. So fever plus essentially exposure. Um, Anyone with so anyone that meets that triage admission criteria would get admitted to the suspect tent um, or tents. Um, they would then, if they had been symptomatic for greater than seventy-two hours, they would have a PCR test um, with a four-hour turnaround time that would confirm yes or no they were infected. If they were infected, they would go into the confirmed tent. Uh, everyone that was admitted to the ETU would empirically get broad-spectrum antibiotics and antimalarials to try to combat other common infectious diseases that may cause fever. So that was standard practice in our ETU. And people arriving with other treatable or surgical conditions just have to be turned away because you're focused on one a single disease. That's right. Uh, so this is part of the complexity. Um, and one of the hardest things, in fact, is the people that have other clinical problems, pregnant women. I mean, this is the one of the most tragic parts of at least my time in Liberia, was seeing pregnant women present um, who had been turned away from multiple other hospitals because they were febrile, they'd had exposure to Ebola. Um, so the concern was, of course, that they were infected and to have any sort of intervention with an associated enormous transmission risk mm. uh, was not manageable in most of the healthcare facilities in Liberia, at least at the time that I was there. And did that pre-exist the epidemic or uh, did those hospitals essentially close or fail to function because of the fear of Ebola? So I think it's more the latter. I mean, once again, these are countries that don't have particularly strong health systems to start with you layer on top of that the really the, the panic and the fear associated with acquiring Ebola, treating patients with Ebola, fear of transmission to others. Healthcare in the country was essentially just shut down. There were a few functioning facilities. Um, there was a referral hospital that we could refer patients to, but for many, many, many months, Healthcare facilities that were not ETUs were completely in shutdown. And this is a disease for which maybe one of the highest risk groups are healthcare uh, 
workers. I believe about 500 of the 11,000 people who died were healthcare workers. Um, so that impacts just the number of people available to help. Right. And uh, what, what's the psychological impact for a healthcare worker of knowing that and knowing that risk? I think it, I mean, I can't speak for everybody. I think it's, um, it, I think people react in very, people's experiences, I think, um, have been quite varied, at least the people that I know and, and continue to be in contact with that worked in an Ebola setting in this most recent outbreak. And their, their responses have been really across the spectrum. Uh, for some people, it's been incredibly challenging and for others they have they've continued and it's been it's it's just been completely manageable um i think of course there is a concern of acquiring the disease a fear of course uh i mean medecins sans frontier was was very clear about rules and regulations in the field to try to to minimize risk and try to mitigate that fear, at least within our healthcare workers. So you've been in other difficult places with MSF, you know, how is this different from working in other uh, crises? I have never quite experienced the level of fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, I can't speak for everybody, but the, the level of panic. Um, I have never really experienced before in any setting. Um, I have never seen patients look so afraid mm. or be so afraid. Um, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing is the, the fear of, uh, of of infection, of even even the smallest contact with with people, things that we take for granted every day, like shaking hands, just mm. completely absent. Um, and I mean, I've I've worked had worked in HIV for for some years before. The only thing that I can possibly liken this to is perhaps the bad old days, the early days of, of HIV, exactly, of before treatment. Um, the other thing that I think is, has been disturbing about this is the rapidity of deterioration of mm -hmm. patients. Um, hours to days as opposed to months. Mm -hmm. 